Here on Health and Homestead, we talk about country living, we talk about growing your own food, we talk about health, and I'm here with my good friend Hiram Rester, and I'm on his homestead, and he's seeking to basically get this place prepared as much as possible, growing as much food as he can, and also somewhat on a budget, which is extremely important because things are so expensive these days. Hiram, why don't you give us a little insight on the plan that you have for your property? I was raised uh, with the belief that you don't just grow what you need, you grow enough to feed yourself and your neighbors. And so um, we, uh, we want to begin to do that. But I was raised uh, mostly with a kind of a farming and gardening background. But uh, with the homestead here, we want to get perennials in place that even if gardening didn't do good one year, that uh, we should be fine, that we should have plenty of food. And so with that, we started with uh, trees. Uh, fruit and nut trees because they can take so long to begin to produce. You know, you're looking at three, four, five, six or more years, even with the nut trees, uh, longer than that sometime. And so we want to get those in the ground. So that's what we're investing our time and uh, the resources, financial resources we have right now to get those going. I love it. And we're going to show you how to do this in a way that is much cheaper than just going around and buying 30, 40, 50, 60 dollar trees how you can do it in a way that won't break the bank. Absolutely, and Chad, I mean, uh, nothing wrong with buying those uh, trees. I, I buy some on occasion as well. And in some ways it's like hitting the fast forward button to buy those trees, because basically you're buying time, you're buying years, you're buying a tree that's a few years older and closer to uh, uh, beginning to produce. Yet at the same time, uh, I'm able to get my trees for uh, really probably about seven or eight bucks each. Many people might be thinking, well, the cheapest thing to do if you wanted a Red Delicious would be just go buy a Red Delicious apple, take the seeds out of there, plant them, and you'll get Red Delicious trees. But that is not how Red Delicious trees come about. Just to give an idea how like an apple tree comes about, one of the things that can happen is you could just take any old seed, plant it, and there's a chance, a small chance, that you'll get a good tree. Most of the time you're gonna get something you don't like. But f give you an example, they took Honeycrisp, which is a very, one of the most popular apples today, they mixed it together with Fuji. So basically they took some pollen from a Honeycrisp, mixed it together with a Fuji, and then they planted at least, I think it's 40,000 seeds. They got 40,000 trees. And then what they did is they waited years until all those trees grew up, and they found one tree that was the best out of these 40,000 trees. And it's called, wow. it's called Evercrisp. And to me, it is the best tasting apple that I've ever tried. Now, people don't maybe realize then you don't just take a, a seed from Evercrisp and plant it and get an Evercrisp tree. You have no idea what you're gonna get from that one. So what you do is you take a little, small little piece, a little branch, I mean, you call it, I mean, we call it a cyan. When you cut it off, it's a little end of a branch. And you take that, and then you have another uh, rootstock that was grown, and you will put those two together. And what will grow out of that from the connection point upward will end up being the ever crisp tree. That's how every apple that you eat in the store, this is the process that goes that takes place in order to give you that fruit. For it to be in the store, it has to be good looking. Some of the best tasting apples are just ugly, but boy, they taste good. Those don't sell at the store. Yeah. Another thing that you can't get at you know at the store is uh, uh, is the apples that don't store a long time. Now it's a good thing to have an apple that'll store a long time, but a lot of the best tasting apples don't. But because uh, they you know you have a growing season in North America and then your growing season in South America and they ship those apples up, they need apples uh, to store for months. So typically your apples that won't store for months with cool storage, uh, you can't buy in the store but some of them are the very best. Yeah, and a, a good example of that is Zestar. I know one of the trees he's grafted here is Zestar. Zestar to me is one of the absolute best tasting apples out there, but it is a short season apple, meaning it's actually, it's an early season that it actually comes in and then it doesn't last very long. So it's phenomenal fresh eating, but it just doesn't last. But to have that on your property is perfect because it's gonna be early number one. And number two, you're gonna have some, you know, for several weeks, you're gonna have some really good tasting fruit. But then with Hiram, he's got dozens and dozens, scores of different varieties. And so some are gonna be early, some are gonna be later, and some are gonna store great, some aren't, but you're gonna get all these different flavors. And to be able to have that when times are difficult, instead of just having one variety, I mean, people love things like Honeycrisp, but to have such a variety, I mean, that's just, 
I mean, that's phenomenal. Oh, I love it. I mean, the idea of having the absolute earliest season apples and the latest season and the ones in between. And another thing you won't find at the store typically are the apples that on one tree will get ripe over the course of a month. Because in the orchard, when they're picking them commercially, they want to go through and pick all the apples at once. They don't want to, you know, pick a third of the apples and come back the next week and pick another third and then guess which ones are ready or not. But, uh, it, you know, so there's so much more variety and uh, things that you can plan for. Another thing, if you just got something from a store, even though if you, if you grew it from a seed from the store, you're not likely to have a good outcome, is disease resistance. So, uh, and, and, and where I live, here in Missouri, uh, you've got uh, several different uh, diseases that uh, can really wipe out your apples. And so I want to get uh, rootstock that's disease resistant and most of my cultivars disease resistant as well. So you're looking at taste, uh, uh, you're looking at precocity, uh, you know, how early it will bear. You know, I want a precocious uh, tree that will start bearing early, but yet, I want to plant enough trees that I have those and I can wait on some of the others that will take several years to begin to bear. So right here we're standing under a wild persimmon tree and not wild ones, but persimmons are one of my favorite fruit. Tell me what you're doing with this wild persimmon tree. All right, well, uh, this tree, it, it's just a volunteer tree, if you will. It just came up here and uh, it was here when we bought the place. And uh, the first fall, lo and behold, we were pleasantly surprised to discover it was making fruit. It had persimmons on it. And I waited and waited, of course, you know, tried them a little bit early and made me pucker up because they were bitter and had to wait till they got really good and ripe. And uh, the taste was wonderful, but it's mostly just seeds. Yeah. And so you're spitting out seeds, trying to eat the persimmon. And uh, so I'm actually reworking this tree. I, I just started with a few graphs here you might be able to see. Uh, so when I say reworking, I'm actually using it as a rootstock, a great established rootstock, and I'm putting uh, other varieties of persimmon on it. And so here's a gyro persimmon. It's rated for zone six. It's a Japanese persimmon. Should make a nice uh, uh, bigger persimmon. And, you know, in the next couple of years, this tree will get to the point that it's, it's uh, continuing to produce a great amount of persimmons, but ones that are bigger, uh, vary in taste, get ripe at different times, and aren't just all seed. Totally. So looking forward to that. And dried persimmon is one of my favorite dried fruits. I love dried persimmon. So to be able to have those all through the winter on top of the fresh ones that you get to eat toward the fall, yeah, that's a great fruit. Yeah, looking forward to it. And a lot of potential here. Uh, that's one of the things that I encourage anybody that's uh, wanting to develop fruit, if you have some property, look around and see what you have naturally growing on your property. So on my property, I've had uh, Bradford pear, which is uh, going invasive here. It's an invasive species in this part of Missouri. And so I've grafted on Bradford pear, uh, good pear trees, uh, good pear varieties, uh, persimmon, and then also mulberry. I'm grafting on uh, mulberry that's already growing on the property. Some uh, already producing and, and others that uh, haven't produced yet. And uh, it's just exciting to add the variety and add uh, some of the, the really nice cultivars. Uh, and and that's part of just your point about finding what actually grows well on the property. Uh, when you know that, that means it grows well in your area probably. And so, because certain things you'll try to grow, they take off. Some things you might be surprised that aren't growing in your area that do grow well, but you'll also find that some of the things that they're not in the area, there's a reason they're not in the area because they just don't grow well. One of the exciting things about fruit trees is you don't necessarily have to be, have an apple tree be simply a pink lady. You can have it be all kinds of things. Hiram, what do you call your tree uh, that you were just showing me back here? Well, on the internet, a lot of folks call them a Franken tree, you know, after Frankenstein. But, you know, I'm not into all the sci-fi stuff. Uh, I read in the Bible where there's a tree in heaven called the tree of life that has 12 different kind of fruit on it. And so I like to call it a tree of life, maybe. And so we've got some of that. We're doing that actually with this persimmon. It's going to end up with probably a dozen or more different uh, types of persimmon on it. But I can show you my apple tree that uh, we've went a little bit beyond that. All right, let's go see your uh, tree of life then. All right. So this is it, man. Wow. Yes. Tell us about it. All right. So when I bought the place four years ago, this apple tree was already here. And uh, I... Uh, when I got all my apple tree uh, root stock and then I ordered my cyan wood, you know, you end up getting a piece of cyan wood that's 10 to 12 inches long and when you cut off your graft piece, you still have enough left for another graft or two. And so I thought, what am I gonna do with all these extra pieces? Well, maybe I should put them on a tree 
Uh, that way, if uh, I need to go back and, and get more of that wood in the future, I'll have it growing somewhere. And so that was where the idea came uh, for this, uh, for me anyway. And so I've put uh, 50 varieties on this particular tree and uh, grafted them all this spring. And so pretty excited about that. Out of my uh, 50 grafts, um, 43 have uh, taken. And I uh, went back and redid the, the ones that did not. And so this, this tree is coming along nicely. So, and so pretty did, happy with it. What you're, what you're saying is you have, you're going to get literally 50 different kinds of apples from this one tree. Yeah, in fact, you should probably, uh, in the next two or three years, as it really starts to uh, come into its own and bear uh, after these grafts, uh, you should be able to get apples on it. Four or five months out of the year, you should be able to walk out here and pick an apple and eat it. Because you're going to have some early season, and you're going to have some really late season ones, yes. and so you're and all in between All there. in between. And so you're going to be able to, and then you're also going to get all different kinds of flavors. Oh, yes. Like, yeah, I love yeah. that. I love that. And then right here from this tree, this will fast track things as well. So I've got some trees that I grafted with various varieties, but now all those varieties are on this one tree. So what happens if I have a tree I've grafted on, and then... Uh, this goes ahead and produces fruit because it's on a mature tree. It'll produce fruit two or three years before my smaller grafted trees will. And then I eat that and I go, I don't like this. Well, I'm not even going to ever let the other one get up big enough to produce apples. I'm just going to cut it off and graft something I like on it better. Uh, one of the uh, guys that uh, Chad, you and I talked about and we've enjoyed watching, the skill cult guy, uh, Stephen Eldholm. I don't know if I said his name right, but uh, I remember he did a video and he talked about you, viewing uh, a tree, an existing tree, like a canvas. Uh, you can paint any picture you want on this tree uh, within reason. Obviously, it's got to be an apple, but we can put any kind of apple on this tree, or we could put 50 kind of apples on this tree. And then uh, uh, once we have rootstock growing in the ground, if it grows up and we've grafted something on it and we decide we don't like that or that's not one of our favorites, you just cut it off and graft one on you want another one you want to try. And some things probably just won't do well. You're probably going to find some of these varieties just don't, don't grow as well or maybe they have serious you know infestation problems worse than others and you'll find some that work phenomenal and you'll go hey this one works great that one doesn't work great and that will at least help you to know for the future what does better on your homestead yeah that's why uh, tapping into an existing tree and, and doing some graphs on it it'll really fast forward you finding out uh, what uh, what's doing good in your area much quicker now this just gives you a little idea. I mean, 50 different apples on one tree, and you could do more. I mean, it, I mean, if, if he chooses to, you, you know, Hiram could put even more someday if he wanted to, but this just gives you an idea of what you could do. Growing food, not only for your own family, but seeking to be able to help out those in your community is an incredible thing to do. And if you haven't seen my video on 11 foods to grow in difficult times, it's one of my favorite videos that I've made. You don't want to miss that one right here. And the next video is going to be right here when it comes out on how to actually do the grafting work. Hiram's going to come back and show us how to do that. If you like this video, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notifications. God bless and have a fantastic day.